Good afternoon, everybody. Did you know that Alberta gets more energy from the sun than Germany? That Alberta has the best wind resources across Canada? That we could actually generate up to 2,000 megawatts of electricity from biomass? So the question then arises, why aren't we doing more in renewable energy? And the answer is, yes, we've been doing it. We've been doing it through the, uh, from the 1970s. The first comprehensive review was done by the Alberta Research Council by two guys, Dennis McGonaghy and John Fike, to look at renewable energy. And the government has had many programs since. But what's been lacking is that crisis that Warren mentioned. We haven't had that crisis because we are such an energy-rich province. But as Eddie's presentation pointed out, the times are indeed changing. And we believe that the next few decades will be the one where renewable energy will become dominant in Alberta. So somebody talked to me one day a few years ago and said, you're Mr. Moneybags. And I thought about it and I said, no, we're not Mr. Moneybags. We are actually a very unique agency. We've, we've taken the best of government and industry, formed a symbiosis, and formed AIES. We have an industry-led board, led by visionaries like Eric and, and Paul. And we have over 200 years of R&D management experience, led by Eddie, and of course, all of you know Duke, who's been around since the Big Bang. <laughs> Sorry, Duke. <laughs> So we have these very, really, really strong evaluation processes. We understand how technologies need to get developed. And beyond just evaluating the technology and selecting them, what we do, and you've seen that all day today, is we understand we provide technical oversight, we understand how the techn technology gets developed, and we transfer the knowledge to people who can use it. So in a, in a nutshell, our role is to lead, serve, and invest. We lead with things like technology intelligence, road mapping, and helping industry see things beyond the immediate future. We serve the government because that's uh, our owner in terms of trying to provide them with the technical information required for them to develop a good policy. And the government gives us money to invest. So essentially, if you want to say, what are we? We're an organization that looks beyond our borders, both in, in terms of space and time. So we do things like technology intelligence and things like strategic foresighting, looking to what's going to happen in 2030 and 2050. We've all seen these, uh, these targets, and these are the targets that the Renewable and Emerging Technologies Group does. Uh, you heard the uh, presentations by Mark and Maureen about uh, renewable energy, energy storage, and organic wastes. So this is the, our part of the pie. You've heard Mark talk about clean power. You've heard Maureen talk about bio-wasted fuels. We also have energy systems modeling, and we have Dr. Amit Kumar from the University of Alberta, who is doing, who's very, very prol prolific. So if you could just capture the energy that he has, we wouldn't need any more renewable energy in Alberta. <laughs> we also try to think, we believe that the timing is right to look at small modular nuclear reactors. Because the size of these reactors actually fits in well with the oil sands, the SAGDI process, and others. We also have a number of programs in the other areas. But the point I'd like to make about these diagrams is that this is not cast in stone. So if, if suddenly somebody comes up with a really novel wind energy technology, it could pretty much bounce from being a watching brief to something more, more superior, whether emerging or a major focus area. But what I'd like to point it out to you in this diagram are two things. And these are things which are cross-cutting across all three areas that we have in AIES. One of them is technology intelligence. And you've heard Maureen talked about how we did that for solid uh, uh, organic waste technologies. You heard Vicky talk about it, looking at trying to um, have water separation at high temperatures. So we are trying to 
develop this capability not only for ourselves, but for our colleagues in government and industry. We also have a very innovative knowledge management system led by Lisa Spinks, and I'll, give, send, I'll show you a couple of slides about that. So in terms of technology intelligence, we have a number of tools. So we do TRL, the technology readiness level, the TRL tracking, and we monitor projects constantly to make sure they will be successful. And after they're successful, they'll go to the next level, the next TRL level that we want. We find technology intelligence consultants like the Signals Intelligence Group. We work with them and try and get them to assess technologies like, like the supercapacitor uh, battery that was developed at the University of Alberta. We also work with U.S. national labs like PNNL to look at technology readiness levels. We generally use a tool called ProGrid to do our evaluations, and they have a second tool called ProGrid TA. TA stands for Technology Assessment. And finally, we try to make sure that once a technology is successful, that they can work with the capital, venture capitalists and try and take the project to the next level. But trying to develop renewable energy isn't easy. Because as you've seen, innovation isn't a continuous process. There are times when everything fits together, and then after a time, things slow down. And I thought this would be a really good example of what we did in, in 2003. The two slides you see on the bottom are actually slides that I prepared for the board, our board of directors, in 2003 trying to convince them that fuel cells was the next big thing. Why? Because we had, University of Calgary had some excellent researchers in that area. We had a number of fuel cell companies that were emerging in Alberta as well. And of course, the whole global milieu was that fuel cells and hydrogen would be the next big things. So we did a couple of really major projects. Uh, we worked on the Western Canada Fuel Cell Initiative, which was an initiative among all the Western Canadian universities to try and develop fuel cells. We actually supported the installation of the first large-scale fuel cell at the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology in Edmonton. And then, all of a sudden, the roof collapsed. And we found out there were a lot of reasons why this thing didn't continue. I mean, as far as fuel cells are concerned, Maintaining power over the time is, is a problem. Having to replace the stacks every five years is a problem. Trying to set up the hydrogen infrastructure is a problem. So the world realized these things only after doing the work. And then things actually did continue on for a while, but not at the pace that they were in the early 2000s. And you heard Vicky this morning. Pace is picking up again, but for a different purpose. Instead of looking at it from transportation and other sources, now we're trying to use the molten carbon fuel cells for carbon capture at SAGD application. So you see this, this continuity and how things emerge. So essentially the point I'm trying to make is the knowledge you gain even when you don't have things go your way is still valuable. And Maureen's already talked about to you about these two facilities we've developed with Duke's uh, leadership, the Enerchem Biofuels facility, which is just about ready to start production right now. We had a grand opening earlier this year. And the Advanced Energy Research Facility. This is a small gasifier we put in. We've had enough space for other people, technologies developers, to come and use this as a plug and play facility. And when we built it in 2011, we said, will people actually come and use it? And the answer is yes. We've got eight active projects in that advanced facility, and we've got a number of other uh, uh, projects on the way. So we're actually considering having to expand this facility. So in terms of technology readiness levels, if you put everything into context, we started with the universities. We've got a number of chairs that we support, like Dr. Kumar's. We do applied research. We do advanced energy research facility where we actually try and plug and play and develop those technologies and end up with something like Enerchem, which is the world's largest uh, first-of-a-kind biofuels plant. In terms of knowledge tra uh, management transfer, I think we're fairly inno innovative there as well. 
We start off with the concept of technology intelligence, gap analysis, road mapping, and we've got a database which starts from 1974 when Aostra was first set up. More than 40 years worth of data, and we make it available to anyone who wants to use it. So it's very important to have this knowledge and share this knowledge with people who can take this knowledge and, and build things with it. And then in terms of current expertise, we've got, uh, you've met a lot of the people, you've heard a lot of the people, we go around going to conferences, making presentations, networking. In the end, we try to end up with strategic partnerships, and you've seen that with the LCIA. In the end, we've got this whole pool of knowledge that we capture. So in terms of the AIES competences in, competences in this area, we've got this knowledge bank. We've got expertise to actually evaluate and do technical and economic uh, feasibility studies. We actually do work with people to try and develop the technologies and validate them, and we try and look beyond our borders, you having a technology intelligence system. So our investment decisions, as you know, are fairly in the technical, uh, it's, they're transparent and, and they're, the due diligence is there. We always want to leverage industry funding. We do have stage gate execution. We do monitor the project. And what we find ourselves unique in, we don't actually want to own the technology that is generated our only requirement is that after a certain period of, conf uh, of confidentiality, that, that report is going to be made available, will be uh, placed on our uh, website for everyone to use. Similarly, in terms of knowledge transfer, we're not only looking at the database, but we're also being very innovative and in trying to develop knowledge transfer tools. And if you want to know more about this, you'd have to talk to Lisa Spinks. Our focus is on engaging partners. We have a program called Technology Informing Policy, which we're working with the government departments to say, you know, what are you looking at? What sort of information do you need to develop good policy? And we do those types of projects. As you've noticed, we worked with industry, all the, the various associations we've worked with, and we also work with venture capitalists. But in the end, whatever we do, we're nothing without you guys, because we are there for you. In terms of government, we help you implement your strategies, inform your policies. In terms of industry, we help you develop and deploy novel energy efficient technologies through pilots and demos that you've seen. In terms of academia, we support more than a dozen chairs. We also do individual projects, and we help train the next generation of, of researchers and innovators that this industry would need. As you notice, we also deal with municipalities in water and in waste management. And in the end, we're looking at Alberta, the, the, the average citizen, help him look at creating new industries as we did with uh, the SAG, the operation in Northern Alberta, create more jobs and wealth. So this is my final slide. Let's collaborate together. That's been the theme of today. Identify your challenges and barriers and we will work with you to find the right solutions. In terms of technology development, our focus is to take you from one technology level to another, going along the uh, commercialization curve. And in the end, our vision is to transfer, transform Alberta into a global leader in all forms of energy, not just renewable, but all forms of energy. My last slide is about our team. So I thought the hockey analogy would be great. So there's Eddie and myself, but the real team, you've met two of them. You've met Mark and Maureen, and Xiaomi, you can talk to her during the networking session. We've just had a new employee, uh, Tunde, Baba Tunde Olichu. He's going to be working specifically on technology intelligence. And of course, Lolita, who supports us. So thank you. So this is the final part of this, uh, this uh, event, which is a, the final the table talks, if you want to call them. <coughs> so again, a 15-minute show. The first thing, first question that we'd like you to, so first of all, look at the green file that you have on your table. Make sure you have somebody to facilitate and somebody to record your decisions. So the first thing you got to do 
is you've heard the discussion by panelists involved with the Low Carbon Innovation Alliance. Do you believe we should have a national organization that drives us towards a low carbon economy? And you, know, you can, if you want to say, say no, we don't want another organization, but if you say yes, explain why you think it's important. You've got five minutes to address that issue, and then we'll go on to question number two. Okay, folks, uh, your five minutes are up. I hope you've taken good notes on this particular topic. If you guys would just pay attention to our next session, it's probably one of the most critical questions that have been asked today. And that is we have, from our energy sector, an annual revenue of over $100 billion. So the question I'd like you to address in the next five minutes is, what can we do in energy and environment to replace or secure the $100 billion per year in revenue by 2050? How would we generate this revenue from Alberta's other resources? So renewable and emerging resources. Five minutes. Okay, I think we are down to the final question of the day. Guys, we're down to the final question of the day. And the question is actually based upon Eddie's presentation where he said, we're not gonna leave all those fossil fuels in the ground because we can make products out of them. For example, replacing steel with carbon fibers the number of other very exciting possibilities that you can use these fossil fuels for in non-energy uses. So the question that I, you have in front of you for the next five minutes is, what are the products of the future? What are your ideas for secondary industries? And how do we actually reach that? What, do, what is needed in terms of making Alberta uh, use its fossil fuels for non-energy non purposes. Five minutes, guys, and that's your final question. Uh, five minutes are up. Interesting to see the discussion hasn't finished. I'd like to thank everyone for taking a glimpse into the future and sharing your thoughts with us. I'd like to now call upon Eddie to make the closing remarks for this workshop. <laughs>